really delighted to be here today and um, to share with you some of the work that I and others and my team have been doing in the area of children and disasters over the past few years. Um, I would also like to just at the outset acknowledge some of the many people who have contributed to this work. It's very complex, challenging work to do, and I have collaborators from all across the country and literally all across the world. But um, I would also like to especially acknowledge the Miami-Dade Public Schools, which really um, contributed immeasurably to the initial work that was done in this area after Hurricane Andrew. So um, hurricanes, OK, well, as Bill mentioned, my area of research expertise for many years has been children's risk and resilience, and particularly peer relations as it applies to children's physical and mental health. Um, so why study disasters? Well, um, I came to this area of research um, primarily the same way I've later discovered other people come to this area of research, which is to experience a disaster firsthand. And my experience was Hurricane Andrew. Now, at this point, I would be really interested in knowing, were, were any of you here in the audience here during the time of Andrew? OK, lots of folks. OK, great. And how many folks, in addition to those, um, are here somewhere in the South Florida area? I know we have folks from all around. OK, quite a few. OK, so you, you understand that hurricanes can be an important issue. Um, and for those of you who are from other parts of the country, um, let me say there are disasters occur all around the world. But, um, but I think some of what I'm going to talk about today also can apply to other kinds of potentially traumatic events that children experience. So well, let's start with Hurricane Andrew. So um, this is now a little bit past the 20th year anniversary of this storm. And this is a picture of the satellite photo from um, the Hurricane Center the day before Andrew struck South Florida. Now, Andrew was an incredibly destructive natural disaster. Um, in fact, it, it's one of only two Category 5 hurricanes to ever strike landfall in the US. And it was so impactful that the radar ball literally blew off the National Hurricane Center. And so it took them even a year to piece together the, um, the degree of sustained winds in that storm. Um, it literally. Uh, devastated a 400 square mile area of South Miami-Dade County and destroyed or seriously damaged over 150,000 homes. Fortunately, very few people died in that event, which was remarkable given the level of destruction. Um, it, it, it engendered um, very extreme rebuilding costs and really up until Katrina was the most costly disaster in natural history. Though I do think Hurricane Sandy might bump us down to number three when all the figures from that disaster are, are tallied. So before I start telling you a little more about disasters, I do want to just indicate why I think this is such an important area to study and understand. And I think probably one of the most compelling reasons for those of you who are interested in children and families is that these disasters occur worldwide and affect many, many millions of children and youth annually. For example, recent figures from UNICEF suggest that over 66.5 million children are affected annually by natural disasters. And unfortunately, because of climate change, this number is really growing. So the estimates going forward are that in the next decade, about 175 million children will be affected on an annual basis. And you know, just as an illustration of this, I think 2011 was a particularly devastating year. Um, this is a, a list. I couldn't even fit them all on the slide. But it's a list of the 28 disasters in, 19, uh, in 2011 that engendered more than a billion dollars in damages. And if you'll notice, um, quite a few of these are disasters that occurred in the United States, largely tornadoes, floods, and also hurricanes. But also in 2011, we had the remarkable earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster in Japan, which, is, which people are still dealing with the aftermath of. Also in 2011, there were massive floods in Brisbane, Australia, um, which is remarkable given that for a decade leading up to that, they were in a severe drought situation. But there were massive floods in 2011. In New Zealand, there were significant earthquake events. And in Iowa, in the central US, there were severe tornadoes that really caused quite a bit of damage. 
And unfortunately, 2012 wasn't a whole lot better since we're still tallying some of the effects of Hurricane Sandy, as well as some severe fires that occurred both in Colorado and in California. So these disasters really affect quite a few children in the US and worldwide. And that is really a reason for concern because children have been identified as a vulnerable population after these kinds of events. Fran Norris, who did a, a comprehensive review of disaster studies, which uh, cumulatively included over 60,000 disaster victims, she identified children as a vulnerable population in these events. Um, so they, this is another reason for a child clinical concern with um, this kind of uh, situation. But I think one other point I'd like to make is that one of the really important reasons from a scientific perspective to study disasters is because I would call them sort of an equal opportunity stressor in that they can affect people regardless of their race, ethnicity, social economic status, and regardless of their personality or other personal characteristics. And in this sense, it makes it unlike many other stressors like divorce or um, even combat uh, exposure, where personal characteristics could play a role in putting that person in the situation to begin with. So these are all like important reasons to study disasters. So with that in mind, I'm going to segue into the main content for today's talk. What I'm going to do is um, describe a little bit about the nature of disasters, but then focus primarily on children's reactions and outcomes to these events and the risk and resilience factors that might predict who is, at, who is going to develop problems and who may recover. And then I'm going to spend the last part of the presentation talking about what the clinical implications of these data are, both for assessment as well as for intervention and prevention. So starting with the nature of disasters, um, I think most people realize that disasters or think of disasters as something that can threaten your sense of personal security or the security of your loved ones. And also, they may be thought of as events that are frightening and out of the realm of normal, everyday experience. But one of the things I came to learn after Hurricane Andrew is that they also disrupt your everyday life, both in the short term, but in many cases for a very, very long period of time to come. So for example, here's, here's a picture, the Im immediate destruction after Hurricane Andrew of Saga Bay. You know, by the way, this area was so severely destroyed that they changed the name of the neighborhood when they rebuilt it. It's now called Palmetto Estates, which sounds, I think, a lot better than Saga Bay. But, um, but a lot of destruction in that area. Um, after Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, these are some photos of a middle class area that was not in but near the Ninth Ward. And this is what the neighborhood looked like one month after Hurricane Katrina. Now, Andrew was a windstorm event, but Katrina caused a lot of flooding. And these were, this is what the neighborhood looked like because people were basically emptying their house of all their belongings and um, some of the building materials because the houses were severely flooded on the inside. Um, this, for example, on the left is a picture of a little boy's room and what was left on the right of a little girl's room. And so this is what children experienced when they went back to their homes, which had been flooded literally up to the attics. It was just a mess of muck, of muck and destroyed belongings. Now, Hurricane Ike, which is one of the hurricanes I've been um, studying following children from after this hurricane, caused both flooding as well as wind damage, as you can see from these photos. And one other, th one other thing down here, you'll notice another trauma that occurs in these events is looting. So I don't know if you can see it from where you are, but this sign says, if you be, if you be looting, I'll be shooting. So this is like another kind of life disruption that people have to endure in the aftermath of these events. Now, we don't just, we know that hurricanes are certainly not the only kinds of natural disasters that cause uh, trauma in youth. And, you know, certainly in California and parts of the West, Colorado, for example, there have been severe fires in recent years, which caused massive evacuations of highly populated areas. And we see some of the same kinds of effects with these, these kinds of disaster. But finally, the main point I want to make about this is 
that these kinds of disruptions in, in one's life and everyday existence can endure for a year or even more after the event. And so this is part of a poignant photo essay that the New York Times ran on the one-year anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. And this is a little boy from the Gulf Coast, not from the New Orleans area, somewhere on the Gulf Coast. And you could see that now a year after Katrina, his everyday environment is still not back to normal. It's still not what it used to be. And again, in that St. Bernard Parish, I had the opportunity to visit a year, a little over a year after Hurricane Katrina. Um, the, ho the homes in that neighborhood now look like this, either like this one on the top left, it was an empty shell which had been gutted and was up for sale, or like this one down on the bottom left, um, it had been completely abandoned and not no one had gone back to do any kind of renovation. Or what was even more common, the photo on the right, were the people who were rebuilding. And so these people were trying to rebuild their homes, but they were mostly living in trailers. And this went on for a couple of years post-Katrina until they had their homes finally rebuilt. So given these kinds of events, how do children react? You know, what kinds of reactions have been documented? Well, this slide I'm just putting up to show you. We've, we've done a number of studies of children across various hurricane and uh, bushfire events. Um, most of these, the, the main point of this slide is that there are a number of studies I'm going to draw on. Most of the studies involve children that are elementary school age, and most of the studies have been um, short-term prospective studies where we have assess children at at least a couple of time points. Um, one of them we were able to follow children at three time points and then a subset almost four years after Hurricane Andrew. So this is the background of the literature I'm going to draw on today. But when we first started this line of research, we weren't really even sure what to study as a reaction or outcome. And based on the advice of some investigators and colleagues who studied Hurricane Hugo in Charleston, we decided to focus on symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. These are now the most commonly studied post-disaster reactions. But at that time of Andrew, we weren't sure if children were going to have these kinds of reactions. Um, and in this slide just lists the main symptom clusters that are involved in the diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, which I'm sure many of you are already familiar with. But at the time of Andrew, we weren't sure if children would report these kinds of symptoms. Um, our first assessment of children after Andrew was three months after the disaster, and many of the teachers and parents we spoke with before starting our project said, oh, our kids are fine. I, you know, I don't think they're really going to have any reaction, but well, we, we pursued our efforts to try and track how children were doing during that year after the storm. So one of the things we learned was that children did report quite a few symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, and we were, we were really quite surprised by this. So if you look at this, um, the graph for three months post-disaster, that tall column indicates that 38% of the children in our, our sample, and this was almost 600 children, um, reported symptoms that were consistent with a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. Another, um, the two bars together on the left indicate that about 55% had at least elevated, clinically elevated symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Now, fortunately, by the time we got to the end of the school year, which was 10 months post-disaster, the number had percentage of children reporting symptoms consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder was now down to about 18% of the sample, or alternatively, to look at it another way, about a third reported clinically elevated symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Now, this is what I call my good news, bad news slide, because the, the really good news is that over time, children are reporting fewer and fewer symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Okay, but the bad news is now, almost a year after Hurricane Andrew, there's still a significant number of children that are reporting symptoms that one might be concerned with from a clinical standpoint. So to take this another step further, um, we continue to study children's um, symptoms of post-traumatic stress following Hurricane Charlie. Now, what's interesting about Hurricane Charlie is that initially the projected track of the storm was such that it should have been hitting the Tampa Bay area.
But two hours before it made landfall, the path of the hurricane shifted, and instead it hit Charlotte County on the west coast of Florida, which fortunately, in many ways, is a much less populated area than Tampa Bay. But because of that, very few people were prepared for that storm. And it turned out to be a doozy because it was a Category 4 storm, again, a rare Category 4 to strike the U.S. coast. And because of the lack of preparedness and the strength of the storm, about 90% of the homes in Charlotte County sustained damage. So it was a pretty devastating event. And these are just some pictures from the aftermath of that. You can see the, how, the car on top of the roof. Um, you'll notice on the bottom right, this is what kids' neighborhoods look like. There weren't even any great safe play areas for kids for many, many months after that disaster. So we, we went in and evaluated children after Hurricane Charlie, now at nine months after the storm, and then a year later, 21 months after the storm. And what we found here was that, again, at nine months post-disaster, again, about a third of the sample were reporting clinically elevated symptoms of post-traumatic stress. And when we looked at those same kids a year later, it had only reduced to 26%. So we're not seeing as much of a decline now once we get beyond that first nine-month, ten-month period post-disaster. And to take it one more step further, going back to our Hurricane Andrew sample, uh, one of my dissertation students, Nicole Vincent, did a follow-up study of some of the youth who had high levels of post-traumatic stress ten months after Hurricane Andrew, which was what we call the high PTS group. And she compared them with children who had few or no symptoms of PTS at 10 months post-Andrew. And you know, what you'll notice is among those with the low, in the low PTS group, almost all of them are showing, again, no or mild symptoms of post-traumatic stress now almost four years after the disaster. In fact, there was only one kid who reported any mild or moderate level of symptoms, and he had been up and down that first year post-Andrew. On the other hand, we've got 60% of those who had elevated symptoms 10 months after Andrew who are now still reporting significant clinical elevations in post-traumatic stress. So, you know, what these data are suggesting that during the first year there's a decline, but after that things level out much, much more slowly, and children who haven't yet recovered are really at risk for persistent post-traumatic stress. Now, we, I'm focusing on post-traumatic stress, and the, the disaster literature in general has done this, but I should point out that there are other kinds of reactions that have been documented in youth, particularly other anxiety-related reactions, like general anxiety or, especially in young children, separation anxiety. They don't, for example, um, after the events of September 11th, kids were reporting not wanting to go to school because they didn't want to be separated from their parents. They were afraid something bad would happen to them. Sleep difficulties are also very common. Um, as are specific fears that may be related to the hurricane or disaster event. You know, and to illustrate this, uh, Christina Hoven did a great study, epidemiological study, following the World Trade Center attacks of 9-11, where she evaluated a representative sample of children in the New York City public schools six months after that event and compared her data to these data which were existing uh, prior to the events of September 11th. So a previous epidemiological study had documented these rates of anxiety disorders in children. But after September 11th, you can see how much higher these prevalence estimates are. And when you take that and pair it with a very populated area, for example, New York City, what it's suggesting is that literally hundreds of thousands of children in the school system might have met criteria for a anxiety disorder and might have been in a position of needing help. So this makes it a huge public health concern when disasters strike very populated areas. You know, and finally, there are other types of reactions that have been mentioned, particularly after events that involve loss of life. Depression, bereavement, anger have especially been identified in youth after disasters like earthquakes, that have caused significant loss of life. Um, security concerns and hypervigilance are other reactions that people have identified, particularly after shootings and other 
um, violent kinds of events, in including the World Trade Center attacks. Now, in terms of so, some recent advances in this area, um, I'm going to also um, share with you a little bit of work we've been doing on comorbidity of depression and post-traumatic stress in children. Um, but I'll also mention that health issues are also a concern. We have some data now suggesting that after disasters, the children who are most effective have more sedentary behavior, have more sleep problems, and don't eat as well. And to the extent that those health behaviors can help you manage stress, and that these disasters are largely about stress, that's, I think, an important point to keep in mind. But we, we also started looking at um, the issue of the comorbidity of depression and post-traumatic stress because um, we, were, we were finding that children are also reporting depression as well as um, significant post-traumatic stress. We wanted to look at that in terms of children's recovery over time. So in our most recent study, Hurricane Ike, we took a look at this issue. Now, these are some photos from Hurricane Ike, the flooding in Galveston where we conducted our study. Um, it was a high category two storm. It really caused quite a bit of destruction in Galveston, uh, closed the schools for a month and plunged the city under underwater. We were able to survey children in the early elementary school grades that were attending school in Galveston eight months after the disaster. And we were able to follow most of them again the 15 months after the disaster or seven months later at the end of the end, end of 2009. And basically, the, the characteristics of the sample of children who we had at both time points were similar to those we only had time one data for. But basically, in, this, in the context of this, um, you'll see that comorbidity is actually pretty high. So for example, we looked at children who exceeded clinical cutoffs for post-traumatic stress and for depression. And basically, 23% of the sample of children reported significant post-traumatic stress symptoms, and about half of them, almost half of them, also reported um, elevations in clinical depression. Same thing if you look at the elevations in depression. We had about 22% of the children reporting significant elevations in depression, and about half of them were comorbid with post-traumatic stress symptoms. So and you'll also notice that very these numbers at time one don't really change a lot at time two, we, we go from about 67% who had not met any threshold for uh, a problem up to 76%, but still not that, not that much change. So our question was what, whether this comorbidity was associated with poor recovery in youth. And, and clearly, our data are suggesting that it is. So for example, across the x-axis, the bottom there, we've got what children's classification was at time two. And the bar graphs represent at time one, and the bar graphs represent their classification at time two. And so you can see here that basically only 30% of the children who had comorbid symptoms of depression and post-traumatic stress at time one reported no problems at time two. So we would say 30% of that group recovered, compared with basically two-thirds of the group who showed elevations in only post-traumatic stress or only depressive symptoms, and 86% of the kids who ha hadn't really reported anything initially. Also important is taking a look at comorbidity um, and whether that persisted to time two. And basically, a third of the youth who were comorbid at time one continued to be comorbid at time two, um, whereas you can see the rates are uh, a third of that for those who only had post-traumatic stress elevations or only had elevations in depressive symptoms. You know, and it was almost virtually non-existence for those who had no symptoms early on. So, you know, we think these findings in terms of children's reactions are quite provocative. And if I'm just going to sum up this piece of the um, presentation, I would say that our main take-home points are First, that post-traumatic stress reactions are very common, especially in the initial months after a major disaster. But that over time, these reactions dissipate in most youth, but do remain high in a significant minority. And that's the group that we are especially concerned about from a mental health standpoint. Third, 
we think that youth who have not recovered by nine to 10 months post-disaster are at high risk for chronic and persistent post-traumatic stress. That's what our data and others would suggest. And that also multiple reactions are likely to occur among youth, and particularly comorbidity of depression and PTS symptoms is, seems to be related to more persistent mental health problems and a less recovery. I also will point out, although I'm not showing you this data, that health problems are also something to keep in mind because children report much higher rates of problems sleeping, problems with health, health behaviors like sedentary behavior, and that may also be a reason for concern. So those are the kinds of reactions that have been studied, but when we started in our work after Hurricane Andrew, we were also really very interested in understanding what predicts children's reactions because that might help to form the basis for the kinds of interventions you may design and implement in the post-disaster environment. And so um, at that point, really, there were no studies of risk and resilience in children per se, um, mostly documenting what kinds of outcomes do children report or reactions do they report. And so um, along with Wendy Silverman and Eric Vernberg, we set out to develop a conceptual model that might help us figure out what are some of the risk and protective factors and what are some areas that might be related to intervention. Because ideally we wanted to enhance resilience and reduce risk. So we started on this risk and resilience area of research. And we use this model as a schema for um, organizing the findings on risk and resilience. And it was really based on a model that was initially developed by Bonnie Green in her work with adult disaster survivors. And we modified it for our use with children. I'm going to walk you through this a little bit step by step. But the first element of the model is really exposure to the disaster event. And that's believed in most theories of post-traumatic stress to be a critical factor for the emergence of post-traumatic stress reactions. And within exposure, we started looking at two elements. One was life threat. And the other was the immediate loss and disruption that's involved in the disaster event. So for life threat, um, we find actually the best indicator of life threat is children's perceptions that they're going to die, thinking that they're going to die during the storm. But others have also measured this in terms of whether, they were, whether there was any injury to the child or other loved ones, whether there was a death of a loved one. This would be appropriate, for example, after an event like the World Trade Center attacks. We also track loss and disruption events that occur directly because of the disaster. Um, people lose their homes, their jobs, their personal property, uh, their friends, their pets, and other kinds of things that matter to them and matter to their everyday life. Um, and this can be even further complicated if this is a disaster that involves loss of life. So, with Hurricane Andrew, we found that, surprisingly, 60% of the children in our sample reported that they thought they were going to die during the storm. Now, there are a lot of people who are here in Hurricane Andrew, and you probably can appreciate why they felt that way, because many children were huddled in homes that were, like, they're in the bathroom, and they have a mattress on their head, and their home is literally being blown apart while they were t seeking coverage during the storm. Um, so it was a very scary event. But um, I want to point out that um, actual loss of life doesn't have to occur for children to fear that their life is in danger. Because very few people, fortunately, were injured or, or killed in the aftermath of Andrew. But it was a very, very scary event. In terms of loss and life disruption, we also documented quite a bit of those kinds of events occurring to children in the aftermath of Andrew. So, most children had their home was badly damaged or destroyed. They lost their clothes. They're um, hard to see friends. They had to move to a new home. They had to go to a new school. Any one of these things could be stressful for a child, but most children in our sample were experiencing two to three of these kinds of stressors as a result of the storm. Um, and this is just to put it in the children's words. Um, I'll read this to you because I don't know how how easy it is to read from the back of the room. But we asked children, what were the worst things that happened to you because of the hurricane? And this is what they reported. So the first child, I had to move away. My uncle lost his house. My turtle died of a heart attack. That one 
always gets me too. So children lost their pets. It was very devastating. Or the second child. The ceiling fell on me. I had to go to a new school. I lost a lot of toys. Or that I lost everything, that we lost our home, and that we had to leave my mom and dad for about three or four months. Yeah. So these are the stressors that children were facing in the aftermath. So when we try to look at this in a statistical model to predict post-traumatic stress, what we did find is, generally speaking, the percent of variance that, uh, that the, these events accounted for was high. They were exposure to the storm in terms of life threat and loss disruption were consistently significant predictors of post-traumatic stress. However, um, especially if you look at the first set of bar graphs, you'll notice that the bar graphs are going down. And what that's saying is, the further we get from the storm, the less predictive those events seem to be. Other events that are occurring probably during the recovery period are now starting to also become of critical importance. So let's move into the recovery period. So in our conceptual model, we also look at what happens right after the disaster, particularly what's going on in the family. Do they have, do they have support in the family? Um, what kind of other life events occur? You know, in the aftermath of these events, you know, life just doesn't stop. Other things can happen. People get sick. Some parents get a divorce. Some of these stressors could be related to the disaster event, but they may not be. Um, we also look at the kinds of support children have available to them and also how they cope with the event. Um, and in the coping area, these are, again, some of the variables that we look at in the recovery environment. Um, in the coping area, what we've looked at primarily are strategies that are either positive in nature or are what we might call unhelpful coping. I think our negative coping strategies really reflect poor emotion regulation. So there are kids who get angry, they blame others, they blame themselves, they take it out on other people. And, and that's an aspect of poor emotion regulation that we've looked at as a potential risk factor for um, coping in the aftermath. So I'm, I'm going to show you a couple of slides. Bear with me. There are little statistics here, but I'll, I'll try and walk through them up, um, pretty slowly. But these are data now looking at our early predictors, our early assessment of children after Andrew, and how that predicted how they were doing at almost a year after the event, 10 months after. We always first enter exposure variables, the life threat and the loss disruption, and that was a significant predictor of their reactions. Also, interestingly, demographic variables, particularly um, children who came from minority backgrounds, were reporting more post-traumatic stress now 10 months post-disaster. I think this is interesting because early on there were no differences demographically, but I think because Andrew and potentially other disasters are very destructive, I think over the long haul, the minority youth oftentimes have more trouble recovering because they may not have the financial resources to rebuild and replace their toys, possessions, whatever, um, as quickly as, as kids who have more resources. So. Um, that's just a, a side point I want to make here, but it, it was true in our work. But then we took a look at the recovery variables, and basically what we found were was that each of these elements of our conceptual model were significantly and uniquely important. So kids who had more life events occurring in the aftermath, who had less social support, and who used more coping strategies that reflected blame or anger, the poor emotion regulation strategies, those were kids who had significantly higher post-traumatic stress symptoms. You know, and remember now, at 10 months, that's probably reflecting persistent post-traumatic stress. So this gave us some idea of areas we could start to eventually incorporate into interventions. Now, this the main point of this uh, model is to show you that as we've segued into our more recent studies, we're trying to look at things in a more complex manner. And so this is, um, this is the slide that gives the investigator post-traumatic stress. Um, but basically, we've got a lot going on post-disasters. You've got events that occur right away, the life threat, the loss, disruption. You've got events that occur down the road. What kind of social support do you have? Are there any other life events that occur? And then, again, these other variables like social support and life events that could still be affecting how kids are doing now not nine months, but now in this case, 15 months post-disaster. 
And when we look at this conceptual model with children, there are three important points that I want to make. One is now in looking at, this, at these variables and they, the way they change over time, we find that major life stressors contribute to post-traumatic stress symptoms. So it's not even just the events that occur at the time of the hurricane, but kids who had more intervening life events like um, parents get divorced or separated, aunt or uncle die, other kinds of events like that are showing more persistent post-traumatic stress. Our second point was that these stressors also lead to a deterioration in children's social support networks. So if you've got kids who are you know, distressed by the storm and now something else is going on in the family perhaps, those kids have their social support systems erode. They have less support from parents and less support from peers. And to the extent that social support seems to be beneficial in recovering from these events, that's an important clinical finding. And the third finding that I think was novel in this particular um, study was that we found that stressors that occurred early on, meaning like between the disaster and nine months post-hurricane, they magnified the impact of later stressors. So if you were a kid who, say, had a parent who was now separated or ill early on, and then another stressor occurred, between 9 and 15 months post-disaster, you had a much worse reaction than if you didn't have that initial stressor occurring. So basically, what we're seeing is kind of a cascading effect of stressors. So the kids who have more stressors um, are, seem to be having much more difficult time recovering and are even further derailed by subsequent stressors that occur. So you know, that kind of gives you some of the recovery environment pieces, but let me um, just briefly mention risk and protective factors that may, the individual might bring to the situation before it even occurs. Um, these kind of characteristics are understandably very hard to study because we don't know when a disaster is going to strike. So we usually don't have this information available on individuals beforehand, except for demographic variables, which, which don't change as a result of disasters. But summarizing across studies, what you would find is that typically um, girls report more post-traumatic stress reactions post-disaster. Uh, minorities, as I mentioned earlier, over a long period of time than the minority youth tend to report more, um, more distress. Younger children, in our samples, we've gone from elementary all the way up to high school, and typically the elementary school age children are reporting more post-traumatic stress. Children with a prior history of trauma may also become or report more distress. What we're also interested in is, are there any prior psychological characteristics that might make you more vulnerable? And here, we were fortunate in one uh, different Hurricane Andrew sample to be able to look at this a little bit more closely. Um, Wendy Silverman and I and, and Sherry Wasserstein had been conducting a study in uh, West Lab Elementary School which is a very stable school population. Uh, and we had been doing this the year before Hurricane Andrew struck. And so we were able to go back in and reevaluate children three and seven months after that disaster and look at whether or not these ex ex variables that um, children reported even the year before the storm were relevant. And you know, we first controlled for their exposure to the storm and for demographic variables. But then after that, what we found was that children's pre-existing levels of anxiety, this is again anxiety they reported 15 months before the storm, did predict how they were doing seven months after Andrew. So suggesting to us that anxious kids are a vulnerable population, even if you take into account how much exposure they had to the storm. So now finally, in terms of um, more recent um, emphases were trying to examine in our work, trying to tease apart these risk and protective factors, we're trying to do a little bit more work on looking at children's profiles of reactions over time. This is more of what people call a person-centered approach rather than a variable-centered approach to understanding children's patterns of risk and resilience. And then not only do we want to look at the patterns over time, but what variables predict those patterns. And this, this is work based on um, George Bonanno is one of the leading risk and resilience um, researchers we have. He primarily studies adults. But he has this model that suggests that there are 
maybe different trajectories of individuals' responses after these kinds of disaster events. And as you'll see, three of these patterns suggest an initial elevation in stress symptoms, but with different outcomes over time. And after a disaster, particularly one that affects a large area, a lot of people initially show up as having elevated stress symptoms. But what you want to do is be able to differentiate those with chronic problems from those who may recover over time. You know, because if a lot of people are recovering, maybe they are fine on their own. You may want to put your limited resources towards individuals who aren't going to recover on their own. So we, we wanted to do this, but quite frankly, there are no studies of children's post-disaster reactions that have three or more time points, except for our early study of Hurricane Andrew. So we recently went about reanalyzing that sample, trying to use this profile analysis. And the benefit was we were able to include children who we had to drop from our earlier analyses because of incomplete data, which is a big problem after disasters because lots of kids move. Um, but anyway, so we were able to do this recently and, and just had this paper accepted. So what interestingly we found was when we looked at the statistical models, we had a, a pretty good fit for two different alternatives. One was a three trajectory model, and one was a four trajectory model. Now in both of these models, you'll notice the most, the most kids are reporting resilience. They have low levels of symptoms across the board. But in the three trajectory model, we had a chronic group, and the middle group was more of a recovering group. What was of interest in the four trajectory model was that there was additionally a group that seemed to have what we would call a delayed onset. They started off low but got worse over time. And then people report this to be the case in, among adults. But quite frankly, as we evaluated these models in more detail and added our um, risk and resilience factors to the model, this four trajectory model really fell apart. I think it's, it's still really, really rare for children to have a delayed onset of post-traumatic stress, unlike adults. But so with this three trajectory model, now oh, here's another stressor. OK, I'm a Mac user. And this is what happens when I switch to PC. There's always a surprise. Here the surprise is yellow. So just ignore the yellow, OK? <laughs> ignore the yellow, OK? So now we've got these trajectories. And basically, the first step is looking at, well, how do the recovering kids and the chronic kids differ from those that fell in the resilient group. And what we found is where the, you can pay attention to the boxes. Those are good. Um, basically, girls were much more likely than boys to fall in the chronic or the recovering group than the resilient group, as were kids who used more of that blame and anger type of coping, the poor emotion regulation strategy, and also kids who were more anxious. Um, so anxious kids also were um, more likely to fall in the chronic or the recovering group. Now, our other interesting comparison is how did the chronic kids differ from the ones who were recovering? And here you'll see that the variables that differentiated those groups were, again, more blame and anger coping, less social support, more major life events occurring in the recovery period, and again, more general anxiety. So. Piecing this all together, you know, I think now in terms of risk and resilience, I think the conceptual model has been really very helpful in helping to identify these risk and resilience factors affecting children's reactions. And basically, I think the key points here are that disaster exposure is a pretty strong predictor of post-traumatic stress early on, but it becomes less so the further out you go in time as many youth recover. Life stress during the recovery period predicts persistent post-traumatic stress. It undermines killed support systems, and it magnifies later stressors. So you know, in terms of implications, dealing with helping kids deal with these stressors is going to be very important. Um, and third, children's support and coping also differentiate those who recover versus those who remain chronically distressed. So a couple of additional areas for potential intervention. And then last, I, anxious youths are also vulnerable, vulnerable in the aftermath of disasters. So they are a group that you may want to deal with and target as well. So I mean, there are a number of areas that we could study further in the conceptual model. But the one thing I will point out is that what we, what we don't know very well is 
we don't really understand family issues that well. And this would be a really important area for further study because the adult researchers study adults and the child researchers have primarily focused on children, but we need to put the two pieces of the family equation together. And that, for a variety of reasons, turns out to be very hard to do in a post-disaster setting. But that's what we have up to now. And let me turn then for the rest of the time we have to talk about what are the clinical implications of these data and what kind of interventions have been developed for this particular problem. Well, first, in terms of assessment, I think a couple of clear implications can be drawn. And one, I think, is that it's important to assess post-disaster symptoms or reactions broadly. So not just look at post-traumatic stress, which is important, but is really not the whole picture. So you also, from a mental health standpoint, might want to ch assess children's levels of anxiety and depression. I would also advocate for monitoring kids' um, health behaviors and sleep, because those may also be indicators of problems. And you also want to try to track what's going on during the recovery period, particularly any major stressors that are going on that affect the child and family. I mean, so if you're evaluating somebody post-disaster, and it might even be a smaller disaster, like a motor vehicle accident or something else less community-wide, these I think these variables would still apply. I think another point I want to make is that you have to assess symptoms, if you can, from the child's perspective. Although I haven't gone into this issue, I will say that parents are not good informants of their children's post-traumatic stress symptoms. And in fact, um, after Andrew and other, other studies we've done, we notify parents to let them know if their kids exceed clinical elevations. And we get many calls from parents saying, oh, I didn't know my son was bothered by this. Um, I think there are many reasons for that, but um, including children often don't tell their parents because they know their parents are already distressed. But you know, basically, um, we find little correlation between the parent's report of the child's post-traumatic stress and the child's self-report. So you have to get this from the child's perspective. I think in terms of screening and identifying distressed youth, um, one caution I would have is that if you screen children too early, you're going to get way too many that screen high for post-traumatic stress, but who are going to recover. I don't know if you noticed, but in that trajectory, uh, there were almost 40% started off high, but then recovered over the course of the year. Um, this was a problem, quite frankly, last year I was in Brisbane, Australia on sabbatical, and after the floods they had there, they had screened children three months after the floods and started offering interventions. But what they were finding was that most of the kids were recovering anyway. So if you're going to do a study that involves a large-scale screening, I would say probably nine to 10 months post-disaster is when you're going to pick up the kids who at least have more chronic or persistent problems, unless you're doing multiple um, levels of screening, so screening for PTS and depression and other things as well. But I think early on, where it would be useful to start intervention would be with children who have multiple problems. So the children with comorbid post-traumatic stress and depression, we know they're not going to recover very well. Those who have major life events and stressors that are occurring during the recovery period, we know those kids are really at high risk, as well as anxious youth. So you know, I think what we need here is a more sophisticated kind of screening procedure early on, because when this affects a, large, a largely populated area, you can't provide intervention to the thousands of kids who may show initial elevations in post-traumatic stress. Now, in terms of interventions, um, one point, general point I want to make is that I think it's really an, an important area for intervention development is in that period roughly between six months and 18 months post-disaster. And I say this because that's when the chronic and persistent post-traumatic stress um, becomes evident. But yet, as you'll see as I briefly go through this, um, most interventions have been developed either for the immediate aftermath or are more targeted clinical interventions that, like cognitive behavioral uh, approaches to intervention, that haven't really been studied until 18 to 24 months after the disaster event. And there's a big gap in that middle area, which is one we've been trying to address. Um, but basically, you'd be surprised at how little evidence there is for interventions in the post-disaster environment. And this is in part because of the way disasters are. 
Um, they are unpredictable. You don't know when they're going to happen. There are all sorts of IRB delays in trying to get protocols and projects approved. There are huge funding issues, um, as well as ethical issues, like how can you withhold help from kids who might be affected by a disaster and just do a controlled study? Very hard to do. Um, another big complication is that government agencies, whether they're funding agencies or help agencies, are often very slow to respond. So, you know, we have this one, um, you know, the providing disaster relief. Oh, you're late. Hurricane Ike was eight weeks ago. Hurricane Ike? We're here for Rita. Rita was in 2005. Ike was in 2008. I mean, this is perhaps an exaggeration, but I, I can tell you that um, um, agencies, relief agencies, are often very slow in helping disaster victims. The other kind of contextual issue you have for disasters and how to intervene is how to actually do it. I mean, who should you be intervening with? With, with children, should you target the child? Or are you better off targeting the parent or teacher or maybe a school counselor? Um, do you um, want to do a universal intervention where all children receive some sort of help? Or should you be doing something that's more targeted? or something, or wait until children develop problems and then do an intervention more intensively. These are all kinds of questions that have affected the disaster intervention uh, literature, and, and we don't have any easy answers to. But I think in terms of um, showing you briefly what kind of interventions are available, I think a, a useful framework is to structure it around whether it's in the immediate aftermath, the early to mid recovery period, or the long term recovery period. So I think what we would um, conclude from some of the existing literature is that in the immediate post-disaster impact, most affected youth are going to show some stress symptoms. But in terms of intervention, the key issues seem to be helping them and their families attend to issues of safety, shelter, and just basic needs. I mean, you can't really do psychological interventions when people don't know where they're going to live the next day, how they're going to get to school and whether they're going to see their friends again. So helping them with basic issues seems to be very, and basic needs seem to be critical. Above and beyond that, the psychological interventions developed for this period basically are very brief and present focused. And also with the idea is that to get kids on the right track to hopefully prevent long-term problems. Now, the interventions developed for the immediate aftermath are primarily listed on this slide. I'm going to take critical stress debriefing off because that has some data suggesting it could be um, iatrogenic. It could actually make people more distressed to do that in the aftermath of a disaster. What we would more, our best practices currently would advocate probably using something like psychological first aid or making use of some better, of the better psychoeducational fact sheets, brochures, and websites that are available to children and families and mental health professionals. Because you're a mental health professional oriented, you're probably going to be also interested in knowing more about psychological first aid. And this can be, um, you can go to the website for the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, which is listed here on this slide, as well as the National Center for Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. Both of those websites contain invaluable materials on how to do psychological first aid and how to help children, families, and adults in the aftermath of disasters. You know, you can see that the psychological first aid primarily does cover things like safety and comfort, providing practical assistance, connecting individuals with their social support systems. Um, this is an, what we would call an evidence-informed intervention. It's based on research, but yet, um, we really don't have any evidence for its effectiveness as yet. Another tool that you might find helpful, um, in 2008, um, I was able to chair a task force on children and trauma for the American Psychological Association. And one of the materials we developed was a tip sheet for mental health professionals to help children cope after a disaster or a traumatic event. And we did this because many mental health professionals are put in these situations unexpectedly but may not have particular training or background in trauma mental health. And so this is a tip sheet that you can download from the internet and can be useful in, in helping you 
um, orient some of your already existing clinical skills for the situation of dealing with a child or family who's been traumatized by a disaster. But that, as well as the psychological first aid, um, these are evidence-informed, but we don't really have any data as yet on their effectiveness. Um, and there are some potential concerns. Um, for example, it's not clear if it's always best to talk to children about these events immediately after a disaster. It could perhaps re-traumatize them if they're um, thinking of something that was very distressing. Um, so there, it may require some sophistication to adapt these kind of materials to new events as they occur as well. Moving into the short-term recovery phase, um, first few months or weeks after a disaster until maybe multiple months, this would be what I would say where Hurricane Sandy is right now. It's already past the immediate aftermath, but there are a lot of families and children that are still struggling in that New York, um, New Jersey metropolitan area. Here, the best practices would suggest that because chronic and persistent stress symptoms are likely to emerge, and because ongoing stressors are going to interfere with recovery, that here the goal of intervention might be to help children improve their adaptive functioning, help them uh, deal with stressors that are ongoing, and help um, reduce or prevent persistent problems from developing. Ideally, at this point, you also want to make, perhaps start to identify children who have more severe or complex problems because they may need more intensive interventions. Now, these, the interventions that are developed for this phase are basically um, community-based kind of interventions. I'm going to describe to you one that we've developed in case you're interested in it. Um, this is um, available both on my faculty website as well as at sevendipity.com. But this is a guide that we developed to help parents help their children cope with the aftermath of a disaster. It was based on an earlier workbook we developed after the World Trade Center attacks of 9-11 called Helping America Cope. That's also available on that website. But you know, after 2004, there were all these hurricanes that hit South Florida, and we thought, well, or the state of Florida, we thought we should really do a hurricane version of this, Helping America Cope. And that's how After the Storm came about. Um, it's what I would call evidence-informed because it's based on the literature that I've been sharing with you today in terms of kids' risk and resilience. It's designed for use in a supportive setting like a parent and a child, or we've seen it adapted in Louisiana after Hurricane Katrina so that teachers were doing it sometimes in classrooms or school counselors took out various exercises and did it with kids that they were working with. Um, so it, it can be adapted for other kinds of situations. It's really intended to reduce stress reactions and help kids cope with stress in a more adaptive manner. Um, this was widely used after, we just happened to finish it a month before Hurricane Katrina struck, which was amazing. Um, and we had requests for over 2 million copies of this manual in the aftermath of Katrina. Um, we couldn't print that many, but you can download these for free. Um, and they were widely used in, in the state of Louisiana and just recently has been Japan translated into Japanese and is being used in a after the earth shakes form for post-earthquakes in Japan. But basically what this involves is there's a section of uh, lessons that parents can do with their kids that are focused on issues that help most children cope. And so this might be a more universal part of the intervention. So generally the advice in the post-disaster environment is to um, help maintain normal roles and routines, to focus on positive ways of coping with stress and try to avoid the anger, blame, or poor emotion regulation strategies, to keep healthy and fit because Dealing with um, stress really requires being as healthy and fit as you can be. So eating a good diet, trying to get some exercise, helping with sleep hygiene so children can fall asleep at night. And then also reducing or limiting TV and media exposure, which has the potential to re-traumatize children. So just to give you a couple of illustrations, um, these are taken from pages of the workbook. But there's a section on focusing on helpful coping strategies and avoiding unhelpful coping. And it gives models of what some positive coping strategies might be. And then we ask parents to help identify how their child is coping. What strategies is, do they observe in their children? 
and then the next page would have the two of them work on a coping plan. Or as another example for help, for keeping healthy and fit, we um, ask parents to look at what kind of behaviors they've noticed in their child that are in those areas. So are they, how are they eating? How are they, are they exercising? You know, kids lose their bikes, their friends move away. Exercise can become a big issue in the aftermath of these disasters. So we have parents try to identify these behaviors in their children, and then there's an activity for the two of them to work on improving some of these areas or, or developing a plan for how they're going to improve these areas. Um, and then also reducing TV time and media exposure. You know, many of you live in South Florida, so you know what happens when we go under a hurricane watch or warning. The media totally scares you. I mean, they basically, they don't get you to watch it unless they make it look like a really scary event. And there's this whole issue about preparing versus scaring. Um, and it's the same in the aftermath. They show you these awful pictures of homes destroyed, people crying. I mean, it, this is probably not a good thing for your mental health in the aftermath of a storm. And in fact, I was intrigued because I, I took this picture from the New York Times after Hurricane Katrina, but we had all these kids that were displaced from Louisiana after Katrina, and they're in hotel rooms, and what are they doing? They're watching TV, and they're watching the storm, and like all these horrible things that unfold in the aftermath. You know, that's probably not a good mental health strategy, because there is research showing that this additional exposure to the disaster is affiliated with higher stress symptoms, both in adults and in kids. So after the storm covers things that should help most children, but it also has special sections on what to do with certain reactions that children might have, like um, fears and worries. A lot of children have anxiety after these events. They worry about, um, I remember after Andrew worrying about my roof every time it rained, but kids have a lot of worries about these events. Or they may have trouble sleeping because of intrusive thoughts and dreams. Um, so there, there are several uh, lessons that are geared toward these kinds of events that might affect some children, but maybe not all children. Um, and there's also a section on uh, preparedness, preparing your family disaster plan, which I think for kids is really important. You know, when we're in hurricane season, and by the way, for those of you who are not from South Florida, you'll be happy to know we're not in hurricane season right now. Um, it doesn't start till June 1st. But if, you, if we have a hurricane, you're in the middle of hurricane season, another one could occur. It's not like it's just a one-time, potentially one-time event. So kids feel better if they feel more in control. And so we have a whole uh, way that a family can develop their disaster plan. So this is an example of what I would call that mid-level kind of intervention. But again, we don't have any really good data on its effectiveness. It's been very hard to study it in a systematic way. We have lots and lots of great anecdotal reports on it and people who have used it widely after various disaster events. But um, you know, possible concerns with it could be, well, one thing, you need a, a computer or some kind of um, internet connection to even download it. But um, it might need also further adaptation for a subsequent disaster because if you've got one that maybe involves um, some novel aspect that's not covered here, you know, it may need a little bit further adaptation. And then finally, um, for the long-term recovery period, this is where we actually have some empirical evidence on the effectiveness of different interventions. Um, at this point, most youth will have recovered, but those who haven't really have persistent uh, stress reactions and really um, might benefit from uh, more, more um, individualized clinical interventions. Here, the data would suggest that cognitive behavior-based treatments, and particularly trauma-focused cognitive behavioral treatment, may be effective in, for this kind of situation. Um, there are a number of studies that are done with very small populations on these post-disaster interventions, but I'm going to really focus briefly on, um, and, and getting ready to sum up, but focus briefly on trauma-focused CBT. Um, this really has the best evidence base for it at this point. And if it's an intervention you're interested in, it, it is um, available to you. There's web-based training in trauma-focused cognitive behavioral treatment. Um, the um, intervention, you can get to this from the website at MUSC, the Medical University of South Carolina. Um, but basically, it, you can see it focuses, this particular intervention focuses on things like psychoeducation, 
stress management, creating a narrative of the trauma. It's got several key components to it. Typically delivered in a 12-week format and typically delivered in a clinic setting. Um, there have been multiple trials suggesting that this is an effective intervention for children who have experienced sexual abuse or multiple traumas. So that's our, our evidence base for it in terms of um, other kinds of traumatic events. And recently, it has been studied in the aftermath of the 9-11 World Trade Center attacks and also after Hurricane Katrina. And um, in Hurricane Katrina, the trauma-focused cognitive behavioral treatment was also compared to a school-based version of it. So for those of you who are working in schools, you may be also very interested in this adaptation of it for schools. It's a little bit shorter. It's a 10-group session treatment um, coupled with a couple of individual sessions. And it has been um, successfully implemented in schools with multicultural uh, populations and with children who've suffered from multiple kinds of traumas. Uh, Lisa Jaycox is often one of the lead investigators in these projects. Um, and she was a part of the Fleur de Lis, pro Project Fleur de Lis that evaluated it in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. And after Katrina, let me just mention this. So what they did was they did a field trial 15 months after Hurricane Katrina in one of the schools in, in the uh, New Orleans area. And children who had elevated symptoms of post-traumatic stress were randomized either to the clinic-based trauma-focused CBT or to the school-based cognitive behavioral intervention in schools. Interestingly, they had much better participation in the school-based intervention. So it was much harder for families to sustain participation in the clinic-based intervention. So there's a huge difference in participation. Um, both treatments led to reductions in post-traumatic stress symptoms, but you'll notice that still the rates of post-traumatic stress were still fairly high. So it was 100% at the start of the project, and it was reduced to 65% in the school-based intervention and 43% in the clinic-based intervention. So it's helping, but there's still kids who remain distressed. Interestingly, they also looked at outcome predictors for the school-based intervention. They didn't have enough participants to do it for the clinic-based one. But the variables that predicted better outcome were more family support, fewer depressive symptoms in the kids, and the absence of additional trauma or stress exposure experiences. You know, so this is, again, highlighting kids who have low support, some depressive symptoms, have additional stressors to deal with as being a very vulnerable population because they were not as affected by this intervention. So um, in summary, in terms of intervention, this is really an important area for development. We have very few studies in this area, and the samples tend to be on the small side. But I would say overall, the trauma-focused cognitive behavioral treatment seems most promising. Um, but we also are going to need further interventions or other interventions going forward for the more complex cases, those where there's low support, high depression, high levels of stress. You know, and maybe in the future, you know, we'll, I think uh, I was intrigued by Tom's presentation of uh, thinking, wow, maybe we can use a family model like that, a brief intervention at the beginning to see where to go in terms of further interventions when kids are distressed. We need maybe something more of a step care model where we do something maybe more universally and then just continue to monitor kids. And if they don't improve or get better, then put them in more intensive kinds of interventions. I think there's also room for internet delivered interventions in this area because we don't really know where and when a disaster is going to strike. And having something that could be more portable would be great. Um, Family-based interventions, I think, are going to be also very critical. Uh, and when we do the workbook with the parents and kids, the parents are always telling us, well, we need a workbook like this, too. You know, so the parents are really stressed, and they really need assistance as well. You know, and finally, I, I think it would be great if we could do more in the, in the way of disaster preparedness, building kids' stress management skills and risk and resilience before a disaster occurs. Um, I think that's a really important area, but a very challenging one because we don't know when a disaster is going to strike. So you could be preparing kids for something that 
may not even happen. Um, I don't know if any of you recall, I, I grew up in the days where we were afraid of nuclear attacks and we all used to hide under our desks when the alarm went off. And I mean, that would have never helped us from a nuclear uh, bomb attack, but that was, you know, and do those kind of preparation things really prepare you or do they scare you? I mean, there are all sorts of issues around disaster preparedness. So, so with that in mind, you know, I hope some of this has been helpful in terms of thinking about children and trauma and children and disasters. And I want to thank you for your time this morning, and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have.